Good morning, church family. Go ahead and take out your Bible. Open up to 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, 2, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 is our uh, text for this morning. My name is Pastor Brent, and uh, it's a joy to be with all of you this morning and to bring the Word of God to, uh, for all of us as we worship the Lord uh, together. Um, I, uh, I remember I was 13 years old when I experienced, the, my, for the first time, uh, the great American tradition uh, of garage sales. And uh, garage sales, I, I, I can't imagine anything more quintessentially American than taking all the junk you've been hiding inside of your house, like literal garbage, and spreading it out on your front lawn and inviting the most interesting demographic of your community to come and argue about how much it's worth with you, right? I mean, that's like peak capitalism right there. And uh, I remember it's, it's, it was an interesting experience. I think, I think all Christians should have a hard time with uh, garage sailing and, and those kinds of things because um, haggling is just something that we're not used to, right? right? So you got someone comes up to you and they they say, hey, how much for this, I don't know, this Walking Dead themed tea cozy or something like that? And how much is this worth? And, and the real honest answer is absolutely nothing. Like, like if you don't buy this thing, I'm throwing it away in my neighbor's trash can tonight because it is worth absolutely zero. That's why it's a, a garage sale item, and if you want to, I, I get this feeling, like, if you want to haggle with me, just, like, I don't even care, just steal it and leave. Just get off my property and, and go. I, I remember um, when I was 13, I was, um, I was selling a hockey stick someone had given to me. I, I don't know why. Uh, I've never played hockey. I've never watched hockey because I'm not from Canada, okay? And, uh, and so I had this used hockey stick. I had it for years, um, and it was old, it was dingy, it was even a little broken, and the original owner had signed his name on it. It was uh, Luke Robb was written on the side of it, and so I'm selling it at this garage sale, and this guy comes up to me with the hockey stick, and he's like, hey, how much? And I just, hey, 10 bucks, right? I, I don't care. 10 bucks, take it. I'm assuming he's going to counter offer like 25 cents and will settle somewhere around a dollar. Uh, but I remember how shocked I was. He quickly whipped out his wallet, gave me the 10 bucks, and walked away like he was the happiest guy on the planet. And uh, it, it wasn't till later that I figured out why. The original owner, Luke Robb, uh, was actually Luke Robitaille, the uh, Stanley Cup winner, uh, All Star NHL All Star, uh, Hall of Famer uh, of the Los Angeles Kings, and uh, a signed practice broken stick of his would be worth upwards of four hundred and fifty dollars per autograph signature signed stick, and uh, and you know that 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 hurts a little, like deep down in your soul. <laughs> Uh, especially when you're 13 years old and $450 is like the world. Um, I didn't know who had written those little words on that stick. Therefore, I didn't understand how valuable it was. And I didn't know how important and how amazing what I had hidden in my closet for years and years and years. Well, for us as Christians, there's a, a book that sits on your shelf or your nightstand day after day, and that book is more important than you know because who wrote it? We're in a series we're calling Hearing God Speak in a World of Noise because I can't imagine anything more important for Christians today uh, than to fixate themselves on truth from God in a world of opinions, false news, and all sorts of political and economic and social turmoil, we 
hear from God. That's what's missing in our world today. That's where true solutions lie. So the people of God need to hear from God uh, amidst the noise. You've got to know what you have in this book. You've got to know who it was written by and what that means before you will treasure it, before you will listen to it, before you will submit to it the way God calls you to. And, uh, and it's a, an amazing reality that we're going to explore today. So uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 uh, verse 19 through 21, it, jot this down, um, jot this down, it's the big idea. Inspiration of Scripture means that the Holy Spirit moved the authors of Scripture so that their words are God's word. Inspiration of Scripture means that the Holy Spirit moved the authors of Scripture so that their words are God's word. This definition of the theological concept we call inspiration of Scripture, uh, often neglected, uh, absolutely foundational and necessary for every Christian in every Christian church, is described for us in perhaps its greatest clarity in 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 16 first as we begin. Uh, Peter is talking to uh, a, this, these believers, and he says, uh, verse 16, for we do not follow clever, cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter here is, uh, he's combating, he's fighting for these Christians. He wants them to hear truth from God, uh, not be not be, have the truth of God overrun by the noise that's in the world. In particular for Peter and the audience that he's writing this letter to are, are the Gnostics. These are the people who are talking. They are the noise, okay, for the Christians that Peter is writing to. Gnostics were a, a group of some of them even claiming to be believers in, in the New Testament times around Peter's era were, that were coming around and talking to Christians. And they were whispering things to them. They were, they were telling them truths, and Christians were falling prey to their lies. Uh, the idea of all these Gnostics were often, the, the things that they would whisper is, hey, I, I've got secret knowledge. Like, I know things that most people don't know. And, and, and uh, um, I, if you don't know what I know, uh, then you then you don't know how to, you can't solve your problems. And the, this is, I know the real cause uh, to the world's problems and, and the real solutions, and you've got to listen to me. These Gnostics um, taught uh, contrary to Christ, and Christians were listening to them, and they made up things. That's why uh, Peter says, hey, we're not following cleverly devised myths. That's not what we do. We're not making, we're not talking about things that were made up by man. We're not talking about fables or fictions. We talk, speak truth from God, okay? The, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty at the end of there, verse 16. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majesty, by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So what Peter's doing here is saying, hey, we were there when this historical event happened. We heard from God the truth about Jesus Christ. God the Father said in our presence, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. We were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. We heard from the Father. We're not making up stories. We were in the presence of God at this very historical moment. And uh, so... Don't listen to those secret truths that no one else knows. Uh, the, those people who think they really know what's going on with unverifiable facts and statistics and histories. We were there. What we have to say comes from God and God alone. And to back up his verification of his authority over people who were making up things and talking about secret histories... Peter relies on and describes uh, our text for uh, what is essential and important for inspiration of Scripture that starts in verse nine, 19. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you 
will do well to pay attention. Okay, so Peter's saying, we received truth, prophetic truth from God. In the prophetic word we'll see later, he's mostly, he's referring to the Old Testament. Okay, he's referring to the Old Testament. He says, these things are more fully confirmed than the myths that everybody else is talking about by the fake histories, by the unsubstantiated facts and, and statistics. You would do well to pay attention to this. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Like this is the sure way by which you live your life. You make decisions and you form your opinions and your perspectives according to what God has revealed in the prophetic word. Look at what Peter says in verse 20. <clears throat> Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Knowing that this first of all, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Now this text, I think, uh, is unfortunately translated badly in the ESV. Uh, the NASB is uh, in some ways a better translation. Um, it makes it sound like this text, Peter is talking about how when someone reads the Old Testament, that it's not just up to them to just to interpret it whichever way they want to. Uh, and that's not <clears throat> what the text is saying. And the ESV, I think, is incorrect in its translation uh, of the Greek here. What Peter is saying, which is more consistent with context and the use of words that Peter is using, is that this, uh, this scripture, the pr prophecy of scripture, no prophecy of scripture has come or originated with man. That's more consistent with the Greek. No prophecy of scripture originates with man. So uh, when the writers of the Old Testament were, were penning uh, the Old Testament, they weren't thinking, well, you know what, I have this idea, and I had this experience in life, and I learned this great lesson, and, and I'm going to write this down because the people uh, really need to hear this. No, uh, the, Old the Old Testament didn't originate like that. It, it wasn't from the ideas and thoughts of men, and this is clear in the context. Look, verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. So it didn't originate with man, and it wasn't about man's, like, his decisiveness, his intelligence, his knowledge, and his experience. It, that's not the origin of where we get the Old Testament. That's not where the Old Testament came from. In contrast to these two negatives, Peter says two positive statements, which form for us the definition of what we call inspiration of Scripture as a theology. Peter says this, men spoke from God. Men spoke from God. And that's why we have your uh, big idea this morning, is that the authors of Scripture, when they wrote down their words, the Holy Spirit was at work in such a way that their words were also God's words. Their words were also God's words. And Peter clarifies on how this can be. How is it that a mere human being, short lifespan, 80 years best, minimal experience perspective, minimal ability to comprehend and understand, minimal uh, exposure, how can Mere man speak absolute truth that comes from God. Peter says it clearly. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, first reality of inspiration, men spoke from God, or their words are God's words. How can this be? Men are carried along by the Holy Spirit. I think that's a great translation of the text, carried along, because the word that Paul, Peter uses there is, uh, is the same word that's used back in Acts chapter 27 uh, when Paul is on a boat that's caught in a storm, and they're trying to get back to land, but they can't because the storm and the winds of the storm are carrying the, that boat along wherever the winds want them to go. 
Okay, and that's the, that's the same description. So uh, Hunter and I were talking this week. We're trying to come up with a, a great illustration uh, for how uh, man and uh, God can be speaking uh, in, in the Bible, how man can be writing it down, but it could still be the words of God. And we were talking through a couple of different things. And, and, you know, I was thinking like a trumpet, but that doesn't really work because the trumpet is really uh, uh, too passive. Uh, and we were, so we were talking like a director of a movie as he's working with an actor on how he wants a scene to go, or, or perhaps a, a conductor of an orchestra as they're uh, working with all the performers, the musicians, uh, on how uh, the, the composition is to sound. Um, all those kind of break down at, at some point. I think what's best is exactly what the, the scriptures provide. Shocking, I know. Uh, men were carried along like a boat is pushed by the wind. Men were carried along like a boat is pushed by the wind. Now, they're the ones traveling. Just like the authors of Scripture, it's their vocabulary. It's their hands. It's um, even their choice of words. But God is superintending their writing in such a way that their words are also, and more powerfully and necessarily so, God's words. So much so that to disregard the Bible is to disregard God. To disobey Peter's words are to disobey God himself. Now, you might be thinking, as you should, uh, well, what about the New Testament, right? Because when you take 2 Peter chapter 1, and you combine it with probably the better known passage uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. Uh, what, what you have are two New Testament references to the inspiration of the Old Testament. If we're going to be technical and we're going to be accurate and detailed, the reality is, is that this passage here in 2 Peter chapter 1 and the accompanying passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3.16 are verifying the, the inspiration of the entirety of what we call the Old Testament from Genesis on. What about the New Testament? Uh, I think that's a, a necessary and helpful question uh, that we need to ask. And the answer, I think, is very simply found, maybe even a page over. Uh, turn over to Second Peter chapter 3, okay? Second Peter chapter 3. I want you to see this with your own eyes because it's critical and it's important. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Look at what Peter says here. Now, remember, he's just spoken of the Old Testament as men speaking for God, from God. And now, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he starts talking about the believer's need for patience. Count the patience, uh, excuse me, the Lord's patience. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as, now listen to this, just as our beloved Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. I love that Peter is calling Paul hard to understand. And if you've read Paul's letters and the, you know, studied Romans, you'll amen to that. Yes, some of Paul's letters are hard to understand. But look what, look what he says here in this text, okay? Just as he does in all his letters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. As they do the other scriptures. What Peter just did there is of monumental significance and is something that we need to realize was true uh, for all early believers in the early church. Peter took Paul's letters and made them equal to the scriptures of the Old Testament as they do the other scriptures. Paul's letters are equally scripture in the same way that Genesis is obviously scripture, as was was believed by every Jew in the day. Okay, so what 
Peter does in lifting up Paul's letter as scripture for us comes and helps us understand a little bit of how we under how we came to believe that the New Testament letters that we have here recorded in scripture in your Bible are inspired by God okay the reality is is that the early church when they would receive a letter from Paul or when they would receive a letter from Peter or from James these things written down there was an immediate understanding that this letter was not just from Paul but it was actually the word of God. There was an immediate understanding. Not all letters were viewed this way, but when apostles wrote and the early church received, there was an immediate understanding that many of these letters and these writings from the apostles were the actual words of God in ways in which other writings were not. And that's clear there in the text. Another example of this New Testament inspiration uh, comes to us in 1 Timothy chapter 5, where uh, Paul quotes two texts. He starts talking about how um, don't muzzle an ox, right? Don't muzzle an ox while he's threshing. That's a quote from Deuteronomy, okay, the Old Testament. Everyone knew that's, that's scripture. But he also quotes Jesus in Luke chapter 10, for the workman is worthy of his wages, and he refers to both of them as scripture. Okay, he refers to both of them as scripture. Pointing again to this truth that the New Testament gospels and, uh, and the Old Testament are on the same level in terms of inspiration, uh, authority, inerrancy, uh, revelation from God. And, and this we should understand. Like, we, we need to grasp this in the, as we consider the reality of what is true about the book that sits in our lap, okay? And we are, we're also prepared for this reality of the inspiration of the New Testament uh, by Jesus. Jesus, in uh, John chapter 14, tells uh, his disciples, uh, flip to it right now. Go ahead, flip John chapter 14. I want you to see this with your own eyes. Don't just believe it because I say it. But uh, John chapter 14, Jesus realizes his days are numbered on earth. He's about to head to the cross. He's about to resurrect. He's about to ascend to the right hand of the Father. And so he's preparing his disciples for this reality and the calling that he has on their life after he is gone. In John chapter 14, verse 25, Jesus says this, this, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He will, bring, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Okay, this is a necessary verse for you understanding the significance of the book that's sitting in your lap. Because uh, you read about the disciples during the life of Christ, and uh, they were some ragtag group of failures all throughout the life of Jesus. And uh, after Jesus' death, they don't get it. Right? They run away. Even after all the, the prophecy, Jesus predicting, hey, uh, I'm about to be delivered up, and uh, all must look to me, and I'm a, I will raise on the third day. After all of the clear uh, explanation of what is about to happen, the disciples at the death of Jesus don't understand what's happening at all. They don't get it. Uh, and it takes the resurrected Jesus to come and to clarify the reality and the significance of what's happened on the cross and in his subsequent resurrection. And so Jesus here in John chapter 14, he's talking to a ragtag groups of guys who most of the time in the New Testament get it wrong. And he says to them, hey, hey when, I'm, when I'm gone, when I leave, when I send to the right hand of the Father, the third person of the Trinity is going to come to you and help you remember exactly everything that I taught you. And you will actually understand it for the first time, perhaps, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you remembrance uh, of everything I taught you. 
Now this text in John chapter 14 and other similar texts in the Gospels formed for the early church verifications for what was scripture and what was not. It went like this. They would receive a letter from Paul and they would realize, okay, Paul is an apostle. Uh, They would receive a letter from Peter. Peter is an apostle. Uh, They were with Jesus uh, during his ministry here on earth. They were uh, with him when he died. They saw the resurrected Christ. Uh, They are have been commissioned by Jesus to preach and proclaim the gospel throughout all the earth. These letters are from an authoritative source. Not only that, but they are consistent with all that we know to be true of God throughout all the rest of the scriptures. And when I read them, I hear my shepherd's voice. The the sheep hear my voice and they will follow after me. So those early church, as they read 1 Peter for the first time, as they received the church of Ephesus, receiving the letter of Ephesians uh, from Paul, they received this letter, they realized it was from an authoritative source that had been with Jesus, they realized that the Holy Spirit had been ministering to him in such a way that the letter that they held was not just man's words, but was God's word. And therefore... They copied it and copied it and copied it and sent it out to everyone because everyone needs to read inspired scripture. That's how we got the New Testament. That's why we have 66 books composed in a cheap leather cover sitting in your lap today. And it's important you know that. And I mean, that's some historical facts and some theological concepts perhaps you've never even considered But you need to know that because someone's going to come to you at some point, some non-believer, some skeptic, and they're going to come to you and they're going to say, well, you know, the Bible wasn't really put together until 325 AD in the Council of Nicaea, or or we didn't even uh, get the Bible until Emperor Constantine decided that he, uh, full of agenda and full of whatever he wanted to do, he, he published it and he put it together for the first time in like 300 AD, and, and so the, the Bible wasn't even close. We didn't even have a Bible for 300 years after Jesus, and all this absolute trash as far as history is concerned, Okay? The early church knew what was scripture immediately, and there was an immediate consensus over what was inspired and what was not. These lies and ideas, 325 AD, Council of Nicaea, these were uh, perpetuated uh, by a book from a long time ago and a movie. Uh, You guys probably know what I'm talking about. Some of you might, uh, The Da Vinci Code. Right, And and the idea is to undermine Scripture by questioning its origin, when in the very pages of Scripture itself, it verifies itself as inspired Scripture. Some people will come to you at some point and say, well, why just these books? Why not others? Uh, Oh, and, and the skeptics will come and say, well, You know, some people decided that these books were good and these ones weren't, and and they'll go on and on and on about awful history. We'll talk about uh, the Apocrypha. Okay, the Apocrypha are 15 books that were, uh, that are part of what the Roman Catholics believe are scripture from God. 15 books, most of them recorded in in between the Old and the New Testaments. Um, These things, these books, the word apocrypha means that they're not accepted, okay? They're not accepted as scripture. They were never accepted as scripture. There wasn't a Jew uh, in Israel who believed that the apocrypha was on par with what we call the Old Testament. They weren't the same, okay? Not only that, there are no New Testament quotes of the apocryphal sources, Jesus never talks about them. He never talks about, uh, he never quotes from them as he does clearly as authority from God, the other Old Testament texts. The Apocrypha is full of contradictions and weird false histories and wasn't even accepted and added into the canon for the Roman Catholics until the Council of Trent in 1563 AD. And the only reason they brought it in to their Bible 
was because of the Reformation, and the Reformation had begun to teach, begun to question many of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church that were not in Scripture, and so some of the apocryphal sources taught things that weren't in the Bible, and so they added them in at 1563 AD to verify some of the things that they had said and developed throughout their history. That's the Apocrypha. More recently, you've probably heard about um, lost Gospels, Gospel of Thomas, Gnostic Gospels, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Peter, other things. These Gnostic Gospels <clears throat> were received by the early church. They were composed much later than what uh, we have as actual scripture, which is obvious because they're forgeries. The Gospel of Thomas wasn't written by Thomas or an associate of Thomas or a secretary of Thomas. It wasn't written by anyone close to Thomas. It was written much later as a popular practice of what would happen. They would write basically what was considered fiction using the names of people from the New Testament. These Gnostic Gospels were known as forgeries. They were recognized as forgeries immediately. And they contain all sorts of weird things. There's a, a cross that talks in, in the, uh, the Gospel of Peter, like it like splinters and it sits there and talks to, I don't know, it's weird. Um, again, the early church completely disregarded them. They were written much later. And they contain obscure, weird theology that is in direct contradiction to what we know to be true and inspired in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So that's why... They aren't in your book. We know they're not inspired. The early church knew they weren't inspired. And the miracle that God has preserved for us, this book, for our life, for our encouragement, for our instruction, should amaze us more often than it does. You should be amazed that you have God's word sitting in your lap. And I think that's what's significant for our time this morning. I don't want the fact that you have probably four or six translations of the Bible in English sitting in your home right now. I don't want the fact that you have the Bible on your phone and you can scroll through it just like you can play bejeweled, and other things on your phone to lead to a casual interaction with Scripture. We have to fight a casual interaction with Scripture as believers regularly. Isaiah says it, says this in uh, chapter 66, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And trembles at my word. When was the last time you took this book off of your shelf and your hand was shaking with the reality that you were holding the inspired word of God, his message of the message of the creator of the universe to you? And that significance of that reality shook you to your core. That God would spend 2,000 years in moving the authors, 40, 40 authors of scripture on three continents in three different languages. Inspired scripture being written. Preserved it in such a way as, as the early church received these letters, they copied them and kept them, recognizing the significance of what they held in their hands. They were propagated around the world like no other document, preserved for us today so that we, 2,000 years later, have God's word accessible at the touch, at the, at the click of a button on your phone. 
don't let the, the amount of times you've heard scripture and the amount of times you've sat down with your Bible or opened up your Bible app on your phone allow you to become familiar when the supernatural miracle that you experience every day is God speaking through inspired scripture. All of that, 2,000 years worth of moving authors so that you could hear God's word. So read it. Don't just read it. Dive into it. Drink from it. Because God did an amazing thing to bring this to you. Brothers and sisters in Christ throughout our history have died for this book. Died to get it to you in a language you could read. Died to preserve it. The enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ have vowed with their life to eradicate this book and to lie about it and to remove it from the face of the planet. But God has brought to you inspired scripture, not so that you could wake up in the morning and do your thing that you're supposed to, oh, yeah, I gotta read God's word, yeah, 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 but so that you can tremble before the revelation of Jesus Christ contained in the text. That God inspired authors to write a text that you and I could understand, and as we read it by the power of the Holy Spirit, we come to true knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is, who we are, and of the world around us, is an everyday miracle that should blow us away all the time. Just think of the beauty of this book. You open it up, and the first pages, you're in a garden paradise. Streams and trees that bring life, man with God. Then sin enters in. By the end of the book, we're in a garden paradise with trees and streams and man communing with God by the sacrifice of Jesus. These themes that are held together, the held together 66 books from 40 different authors testify to us the reality of the book that we hold in our hands. It's not just ideas from men written over 2,000 years. It has themes written in it that cross, uh, that span time, that span the beginning to the end because this book is authored by God. And the, the beauty of these realities that God, as God speaks to us, and develops truths over thousands of years as he progressively reveals himself in greater ways and in the greatest way in his son, Jesus Christ, as recorded in the New Testament. I mean, this is, this is crazy that God has done so much to speak to us today. How dare we be so complacent or, or so familiar with God's very word? These themes are beautiful, the details of the text themselves, I mean, just the, the tense of a verb can change your life. And if, since God's writing it, he, he's speaking and he's working in details that just the authors can't even come to comprehend. And so we can study this book and, and take a microscope to it and analyze and analyze the verbs and look at the conjunctions and look at these and these details will change your life. They'll change your life. It's an amazing book. And yeah, sure, it sometimes we wish it was a little clearer, right? Sometimes it's like, why is this? in the text. Why am I reading a literally a book called Numbers about numbers, right? Right, we've all been there. And, and sometimes we wish, God, why wouldn't you just speak a little clearer to us? But, but can you just, just consider that? Like, what if God actually gave us a textbook? You know how awful that would be? Right, what if he gave us a systematic theology or a biblical theology? And, and we... We would just know God as a concept, as precepts. But instead, the beauty of the scripture is that over 2,000 years and 40 authors, God gives us himself. 
He describes how he loves us and interacts with people who are just like us. He reveals uh, objective principles and truths through the life of believers just like us. He speaks clearly uh, verbatim through the mouth of the prophet. He speaks in beauty of the poetry of the wisdom literature. He speaks through the precepts and the concepts written and recorded for us in the epistles. He speaks to us through the life of Jesus Christ in such beauty that we know, we know God not just as a concept, not just like we know math, but as a person who relates with us, who interacts with us. We know what he feels about us because he tells us what he feels about other people and the beauty that God would record his word in a, a, just a, a variety of genres, in a variety of different ways. He would speak through different words and different, uh, at different times in such an amazing way that every human being on the planet can open up this book and find something that is amazing, that speaks to them and their personality, that God would reveal to them who he is and the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. This book is amazing. So I'm asking you to be amazed at the miracle that exists within your lap right now. If you want an everyday miracle, that's it. If you want proof that God exists, the fact that you have this text at all is that proof. Secondly, I'd ask that you consider uh, and you'd recognize the value of discipline. The value of the discipline of searching the scriptures. I think our generation uh, has lost this understanding. We talk about as, you know, the younger people in this room will talk about being authentic, right? Millennials want to be authentic. And, and so, you know, if, if, if you wake up and, and uh, you don't, you, you don't want to fake anything, you don't want to do something that you don't want to do, you want to be authentic, you don't want to be hypocritical. Um, and so, you know, you'll wake up some mornings like, man, I, I really don't want to read the Bible. That's just a reality of what it means to be still working in an imperfected flesh. We wake up some mornings and we're like, I don't want to read. And because uh, those of us who are young want to be authentic, you just, you just won't, right? Our, our brothers and sisters, our older saints, our exemplary uh, mothers and fathers, as Scripture calls you, uh, you guys are more disciplined. Like, you get it. There, you've got... Uh, a schedule, and you're working through a process of reading through the Bible in a year, and, and we're very, I'm very thankful for the example that you set for us. Because the reality is that even though at times we wake up in the morning and we don't want to read the Bible, the value of Scripture as the inspired Word of God means we should. And don't worry about being hypocritical, okay? It's not hypocritical we, to to read the Bible when we don't feel like it. It would be hypocritical if you were judging everyone else. Oh, I read the Bible every day, even though you're just going through the motions and, and you don't let people know that, you know, hey man, I wake up in the morning and sometimes I don't wanna, wanna read the word. If, you, if you're secretly hiding this, this hatred for God's word, but just going through the motions and then judging everyone else, that's hypocrisy. But to just talk with your small group, you know what, this week I struggle. I didn't wanna read God's word. And, but to read it anyway is still a valuable exercise that will change your life because even though you don't want to read it, it can still change you. And yes, we should want to read it. And until that day comes, we're going to still read it because it's the word of God that, that brings further hunger for the word of God. And your, your heart isn't going to be changed if you keep on just being authentically playing your video games or binge watching Netflix instead of getting into the word of God, even perhaps when you don't feel like it. The value of discipline is necessary because God inspired the word and we need to dig into it because God changes our lives through it, through the themes, the details, through all of it. Scripture is valuable. Scripture is valuable. But thirdly, I'd have you consider this. I want you to realize that every believer thirsts. Every believer thirsts for inspired scripture. If you've been saved by Jesus Christ, if you have faith that Jesus died for your sins, that your sins were placed on the cross, 
And as he died, he died the death that you deserve. If you're a believer that believes that Jesus rose on the third day, defeating sin, defeating death, and paved the way for your eternity with God, as he sits at the right hand of God, if you believe that, you've received that message from Scripture And as God has worked in your heart and made you a new creation, that that new creation in you, every believer who has been made new thirsts at some point in his life for Scripture. There, There should be an undeniable desire to know God and to draw near to him in his word. If you've never experienced that, I question whether you're truly a believer. Because the scriptures say that as the deer pants for the water, right? This is is what we're talking about. Yes, believers struggle in the mornings in their desire to read scripture, but also equally true that those who have been saved by grace experience the grace of an insatiable hunger to know God through his word. It is worth the work, it is worth the discipline, and it from our hearts opens up a thirst for more truth, more life-giving Jesus. As babies long for milk, Christians long for the Bible. Because the Word of God is the Son of God, and as your Bible sits on the shelf, Jesus sits on the shelf. As you receive the Bible is the way you receive Jesus. And if you're not enjoying the Bible and you're just going through the motions just to check something off a list, you are just trying to check Jesus off of a list. So inspired is the word of God. And so as Christians, yes, we discipline ourselves to read the Bible every as often as we can. The Bible doesn't require every day, but we meditate every day on the truth from God's word. We open up God's word uh, we, because we, we know we ought, but we also have that hunger, that thirst. Because we've experienced living bread for the hungry, living water for the thirsty. We've experienced light For the blind. And when we open up this text, it's not just a history, it's not a textbook, it's not a rule book. It is it is living and active. It is living and active. It is it is at work in us. It's 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 dividing in between our motives and our thoughts. It's helping us see things clearer in ourselves than we ever have before. It's producing, it's changing us because the word of God is inspired by God. It's the word of men. They wrote down the word of God himself. And so, don't tell me the Bible's boring. This isn't dry facts on a page. This isn't theology that's abstract from life. This is life-giving truth that encourages your soul and is the solution to every true problem you face. Dive into it. Give yourself to it and feel the pleasure of God as you enjoy him from his inspired text. Many of us need to continually ask the Lord for the Spirit to come and give us a thirst, to renew our thirst for the Word of God, to renew our hunger for Jesus in the pages of Scripture. Do not neglect the spiritual discipline of crying out for a heart that wants the Lord, that desires Him, and is see the glory of God revealed from the Scriptures. Can I pray this prayer for you? Father, we we confess now, Lord, that um, we, as your people, have often come to your word with apathy, with coldness. We wield it like a baseball bat. We have neglected it and treated it with casual familiarity. 
instead of what it truly is, your inspired word. So, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that when we open up these pages and read this text, we are hearing you speak. May we be amazed and in wonder that you would speak to us at all, and, Lord, may you stoke in us a hunger and a thirst for your word. Lord, that our lives would be changed by its pages, that the truths uh, of your son Jesus would be reflected in us day after day, and that you, the gospel would remain at the center of our lives as we seek to be faithful until your son returns. Lord, give us a high view of scripture. And may we know you by the power of the Spirit, by the power of your word, and glorify you every day. In your son's name, amen.